panel discussion now. And then we will also take some questions from the audience, of course, because I'm sure that you have a lot of questions, like you spinning around up there. And we would like to help you uh, get some answers to that. So in the panel, as we can see here already, we have Christoph Dreyer, who is from Reporters for Borders, and he will moderate the talk. And then we also have Nicola Enon, and he is the French reporter who spent a lot of time in the Middle East and was captured in Raqqa and was held captive for 10 months by the ISIS. And of course, we also have Aziz Alhamsa. He doesn't really need an introduction, but uh, yeah, he's one of the founders of uh, Raqqa is being uh, slaughtered silently and still works for it. Yeah, and I will now give the microphone to Hasis and we will start the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I know it's like been so late and you have work tomorrow. So again, thank you for coming. Thank you to the uh, Berlin Film Society and thank you to uh, Bufa for making this evening possible. Um, thank you all for coming. It's good to see that so many people um, are interested in this important topic. And um, well, first of all, Aziz, um, how are your colleagues and friends in Raqqa doing nowadays? Yeah, they're like all doing okay. So since the movie was done, nothing really happened or changed up to our colleagues. So we were all doing good and the baby he turned to be a year ago and he's like just running around everywhere so all, all of us are good how i mean the the um well the milita military situation in, in raqqa has changed a lot <laughs> recently um so um there is a new situation on the ground there for for your colleagues what does it mean for your work how how are working conditions for your colleagues on the ground in raqqa at the moment, what can they do? Um, are they facing any restrictions at the moment? Uh, what's the new situation for them? Yeah, so like since the, mo like the movie was, like we finished filming in October last year and the movie was premiered in Sundance and since that time when the movie was done, like many things change in the situation. Right now we don't have ISIS anymore, but the thing that we have like a new group that's being com committing human rights violations against the civilians. So for us as a group, we keep, we keep doing the same thing, just to report and to document the human rights violation against the civilians. It's been also so hard for us because we can't show our identities inside. So even for my colleagues inside, they can't show their identities because the new group is accused us being an ISIS supporters. So it's like not a new thing because we are not belong to any political party and we're like kind of independent. So all people that are accusing us to being like a pro other group. So sometimes like people, they were like ISIS, sometimes like coalition supporters, sometimes YBJ, sometimes Assad. So yeah, sometimes just crazy to hear all that stuff, but it's been like so hard. So ISIS was defeated, but the situation in the city is all like it's completely changed. So right now, 90% of the city has been destroyed. Thousands of people being killed during the last battle. So recently there was a battle led by the international coalition led by US and other European countries, including Germany, and then they were like responsible of the death of, of the civilians. And yeah, like this year the number of civilians who've been killed by the coalition is way more than the number of civilians who've been killed by ISIS. Nicola, um, you've been following the Middle East closely for quite some time. Um, but one thing that struck me in preparation for this evening is that, I mean, we've seen a lot of reporting um, uh, until the fall of Raqqa um, from ISIS rule and uh, uh, around this uh, battle. But right now we're seeing pretty little, um, although, I mean, in theory, it should be easier now to report from there, also for international reporters. 
why do you think is there so little that we're seeing out of Raqqa at the moment? Well, actually, the, uh, there is a blackout also ordered by the new uh, runners, uh, by the new people um, in charge of Raqqa. Um, one of the very good examples of this blackout has been uh, the conditions of the very end of the battle. There has been a beautiful piece of reporting uh, broadcast, broadcast by the BBC. Uh, you must have uh, seen it. Uh, it's named uh, Raqqa Dirty Secret. It's about uh, the deal that has been broken between the YPG and the, um, and the last uh, bunch of uh, ISIS fighters and how they negotiated to be uh, well, safely uh, extradited from the city. So, and in order to protect this dirty secret, well, the, uh, the YPG has just expelled all the international journalists from, uh, from the city because they didn't want the world to know that they were dealing with the people they were pretending to fight. So, uh, in the Middle East, things are never as simple as people think. It doesn't mean that there is any kind of conspiracy. Uh, it just means that, uh, well, there are crossed interests, uh, that there is actually a complex network of crossed interests. Yeah, so like I need just like to follow up because about that things like uh, just to clarify some things why BG is like part of SCF or like they're like the majority of SCF who's rolling everything and they're like supported and funded by US and they led the battle against ISIS and in some point at the end when ISIS was around in, in like in a small any neighborhood, they had this agreement that let like ISIS fight fighters just to get out of the city, and yeah, that was like at the end, like after like thousands of civilians were killed. So they could do that things early in the beginning, and that would avoid like thousands of people being killed. That avoid that would avoid like the destruction that happened in the city. But like the coalition, the international community was not like they didn't really plan for the battle, like they were not organized at all. Their main reason is just, like their main reason was just to get rid of ISIS, like in, in, like in which way. So they didn't care about civilians. And that's the thing, like what happened even with the media. So I've, I've found like, that was, like most of the media organization just like reporting are oh, like ISIS is defeated. But like, what about the civilians? How they were like defeated, like where they are? Like we, we've never seen any of them being arrested or like being pushed or shown in the media. So all these question marks as like people are like asking about many things. Like where are like the arrest, like the people who've, who've been arrested by ISIS. So nothing appeared after ISIS was defeated from the city. It's still like almost the same situation. Are there any, <clears throat> any other, I mean, apart from, from yourselves, um, your, your colleagues, are there any media initiatives, media activists, attempts to set up uh, new media, anything like that yet in, in, in Raqqa? So far, so far it's been like so complicated because YBJ prevented most of the media organization or civil society organization to do anything unless they are unless they've been registered with them. And right now we've seen only like some groups who are working up like cleaning streets, like painting streets. There is like nothing effective. And for us we've been trying just to set up many campaigns or like many stuff to do, talking about children, talking about women, talking about people like our generation that's been living with ISIS for long term. So those people should be educated or like be aware about what happened with them. But it sounds so hard like speaking about the new group that captured the city. And yeah, so we're trying to do many things. Many organizations were prevented. RBSS itself was also prevented by YBJ to do anything. So we're trying just to figure out any ways. And if we will not do it in public, we will do it in secret. We were like a group that been dealing with ISIS and we were like just, we like we drove ISIS crazy. So it's easy for us to drive anyone else. Uh, is, is there still a threat for, for your colleagues in, in Raqqa from ISIS extremists hanging around the region, uh, having gone underground, anything like that? 
For sure. So that's the reason why we didn't show the identities of any of them, and not even from ISA, from YBJ, from Assad, from other groups. So we were like many groups are interested to find out about us and like the threats are not only like in Rockas, like for all of my colleagues wherever. So it's been like such a harsh condition for all of us, but like even though but we still we still able to operate and do all that stuff. And yeah, so as I said, like either in secret or in public. We're talking about the group here, Nicola, that's um, been f trying to counter the narrative of ISIS and, and doing, doing so in a very impressive way. Um, how, when we're tr yeah, talking about countering uh, this ISIS propaganda, how should we, how should we talk about uh, or how should we show this group and uh, what's happening in, in Raqqa and how shouldn't we? Well, I'm wondering if I should uh, start now criticizing the movie <laughs> because there is, well actually there are lots of very interesting points and very strong parts in this movie. There is just one thing that I would, uh, one point that uh, I would uh, like to, um, uh, well, criticize. It is uh, the fact that um, your job actually as is, your job was not that much to uh, document the atrocities of IS. Why? Because the atrocities of IS, while well, IS was documenting them themselves, they were just showing them off every, everywhere. So actually there is no need. Usually when you have to document about uh, a criminal, well, you will just document his crime and bring to the knowledge of the world the kind of atrocities that this group commits. But with such a group, there is no need for that. Because actually, if you show off these atrocities, you will not fight the group, but propagate its propaganda. What you have done that is very powerful, well, this is my, uh, the, the small uh, well, point I would like to do. There, I find there, there, there are way too many pictures of uh, executions in this movie. Uh, this movie, have, uh, for me, would have worked f well enough without all these pictures. But what you have done that I find very powerful, what needs to be shown about ISIS? Just the fact that this mad project of a caliphate was totally dysfunctional, that the doctrine was not working, that uh, the economy was not working, that as a state, it was not working. And this, these are the facts that needed to be documented. And fortunately, you were there for that. You were there for that. Yeah, so like for us, like it's kind of response. So we've done like many campaigns, like one of it's called like the other side. If you've seen like the line of people who are waiting in line. So that was like a way to counter the propaganda. So ISIS kept saying that our rock is a paradise. People are having like a great, nice life. But like for us, like just showing this kind or like this line or queue of people waiting in line to get the food, that was like, oh, like that was so important to, to the people to know. And later on, like the activities that we've done inside Raqqa, so ISIS, they shut down like all, like they shut down everything, like the TV, the satellites, even the internet, they let like a couple of them to work and they were like controlled by ISIS. For us like to do this magazine thing, so we were like sending messages, we had like articles, we have like a section, it was like cartoon, like just to send messages to the children because they had no access to the education only to ISIS one and then like we were sending messages to their parents not to keep them out in the street so we didn't go like in details and like I'm not the movie maker by the way so I was like just being felt it wasn't like it's you yeah I know I know yeah it's like just to clarify that thing so all the activities that we were doing it was like just such a way to show that there is a resistant movement in the city so to have this resistant movement in the city it was so important and then we've done like many projects outside so as an example there were like many things so we helped a French woman with her kid to put them in touch with one of the Frisian army brigade and 
and they get them out and like we like we interviewed this woman and she was speaking why she went there what the fact that she she faced so we've done like several of things and like okay that was like in rock up to the to come up like to the magazine up to the gravity campaigns poster or whatever and they've been we've been like outside like speaking with muslim communities sleeping like i say speaking with like with the school students with the university students just to educate them to go bring awareness like being in the interviews so all that things was like also a way to draw attention and our main way was just to counter this propaganda so we've been following each video each photo trying just to find mistakes to show the reality we we're speaking about the economy but i know like it's so hard like to document all that things in 90 minutes and like for me i'm i have no idea about making movies so i'm like like a good speaker but like I don't know how to make movies so and like even for me I don't know how to book a logo in a photo so I still like using the paint and with Mac I face like so a problem so I'm so bad up this up to this technology uh, I'm sure there are many questions from the audience um, so I suggest we wait might open up for a first round of questions from the audience um, I hope Rebecca might, might help me because I actually I don't see anything from here. <laughs> so, uh, but if you just raise your hands, we'll find you some somehow, and maybe we could collect uh, collect a few questions. Thank you. In the beginning, uh, I am so proud of you. I come also from Syria. I will ask you a strange question because. I was uh, until 2013 in Thai or I in part for revolution and uh, until there it's no Daesh, no ISIS exists and uh, I am arresting in 2013 until 2015 in the Bashar al-Assad prison and then I go out and then I see all Daesh, ISIS everywhere. I ask myself, it's come from where? Okay, it's like basically it's a good question. Let's collect a bit. Let's, collect. Okay. Let's just collect uh, maybe I three or four questions. Like a bin. <laughs> yeah, I think that's yeah. Okay, like we'll do it like one by one. So, so basically, like ISIS is not a new thing. So it started like if you want to talk about ISIS, not like a group more than an ideology. So it started in. It started like with Taliban turned to be Al Qaeda and it ended up with ISIS, which is basically a united between Islamic State in Iraq, which is exists like after Iraq war, and Nusra Front, which is Al Qaeda part in Syria. So they gathered together and they established ISIS. Be that like the main it's like the main fault of the international community because what they've been doing all the time is just to defeat the arms and like wherever cities or counties where they defeated those extremism groups, they didn't do anything later on so they let those people just to figure out their own problems so and speaking about generation of people who've been living with those extremists they turned to be like another generation of extremism so most of the people who came from Iraq I noticed when ISIS first came to Raqqa they came with only two cars and they drove like to the countryside and then basically it started from a Nusra front itself which from Al Qaeda so it's not a new thing so this ideology being like everywhere and it's, it was not be ended like in Syria and Iraq. We've seen ISIS like right now in Philippines. It's been like in Central America, and no one is drawing the attention there. So, like in my opinion, Philippines will be like the next country, and no one is trying to do anything. Like the like the level of extremism is increasing day after day. So it's like the thing of the ideology. So that's the reason why we've seen attacks everywhere. Like what happened in Manchester, like in Orlando, in Asia, in Africa. Everywhere, it's because of the ideology. ISIS were able, like, to convince or to spread this ideology everywhere, and that's the reason why we're pushing, like, everyone and the international community to focus more on the derecalization programs. There are, like, many people who've been living with those people, and they like talking about Syria, about Iraq. So we might face a new generation of extremists because like no one is focusing how to deal with those people. So it's like about the ideology thing and this ideology started to be more like organized because before ISIS, everyone was shocked by the name of Al Qaeda, Osama bin Laden, like September 11, all that things. And right now, no one is mentioning Al Qaeda anymore. They are like just disappeared. And like many experts, they consider them like civil society organization comparing with ISIS because like I've never heard anything about Al Qaeda recently. It's like always ISIS. 
promises. And that's the thing. So if like this ideology will not be defeated, and it, the only way to defeat this ideology is like with another idea or ideology, you can't go and like bomb this ideology. So the airstrike like increase the level of extremism. So that's the, that the point. It's like more or less not about the groups, how they started. It's about this ideology and how it's been developing all the time. So, and like, I'm so worried that like, we'll face something worse than ISIS and we'll do the same thing. Uh, ISIS were like so cute comparing with the new thing that we'll face. Any more questions? Yeah, I have a question that's actually going a little bit in the same direction because we've seen um, the children and the propaganda and that they're not going to school, spending time in public squares and watching all the ISIS propaganda. And now that, well, apparently ISIS has been driven out of Raqqa. So what, what's happening to the children now? Is it like this de-radicalization that you are talking about? How is this actually happening? Is it happening? And how, how easy is it to get those ideas out of the heads of the children that have been infiltrated by this propaganda for such a long time now? Yeah, so like, unfortunately, I, as I said, like the international community is interested in using like airstrikes and bombs. So they like, they can spend like billions of dollars just like with airstrike and military campaigns to defeat like such a groups, but they don't focus on that things up to the education and awareness. So they think like, okay, with power and airstrikes, we can solve everything. So right now those children have been left alone. So like Raqqa is not the first city. There were like many other cities where ISIS were defeated and the cities, those cities or towns were like left alone, like completely destroyed. No one like care about those children or like this generation. So that's the thing why like civil society organizations should take a part of that things. Because if we will wait for the international community, we might die. So I, I'm like, I'm all like I'm so pessimistic up like United Nations, like international communities, governments, because they're like so professional giving speeches, not nothing more than that. So for like right now and like I like the main focus of ISIS was the children because they were like easy to recruit, speaking about rock cabbie where they've been like they were living in really hard conditions where children had like had no access to education, had no access to anything, only access only ISIS education and propaganda. And the problem that their families were not able to provide them with many things as children. And they found ISIS, the good guys who were like giving them money in dollars, mobile phones, were giving, giving, making them like games, and like giving them all things that their families were not able to provide. So, and like for each children who joined ISIS, he or she didn't need a permission from her or his family. So it was like up to them and ISIS knew how to use them. And like early in the beginning, like there were like a huge big number of, uh, of children who've been like, who bombed themselves or, or, or like they were used to carry weapons and medicines and they were like using them as a time bomb just to protect the main ISIS fighters and leaders. So that we, we did like, we like one of our duty was like through the magazine to educate their families and the children themselves. But later on, we're trying to work on that thing, to work with the children, but so far up to the conditions in Raqqa, the new group that's controlling the city, it seems so hard, but we will do it. Like, as I said, either in secret or in public. So it's our city, we know like every single meter, we know how to deal with it. Like we've been, like we grew up there, we know how, like we did all that thing, so ISIS couldn't stop us. So I don't think like this new group will be able. So we'll do something for sure. Thank you. Do we have another question from the audience? Hey, uh, Aziz, um, we know each other. Thank you again for all you do, and I'm so impressed and so wonderful to finally see this movie. Uh, I was wondering if you could, you had like one or two concrete suggestions for us as audiences now seeing this work you've been doing for so long and that you're now like spreading and looking broader than Syria also, but also very much in Syria. What could we do to support that, to help that? very specifically, like when we go home tonight. So, thank you for this question. Like, 
I'm always happy to see you. So yeah, so there are like many things that you can do, like speaking about Germany or like then like especially the West. So you're like able like to make like many affected decisions. So speaking about you, I believe that most of you are like EU citizens and you're like responsible about like electing your governments. Speaking here about Germany, it's been like the first time since the Second World War when like F FDF or like the right wings that got to the parliament. And like I noticed that like 40 percent of the German they didn't vote like not this election, the last election. And like the majority they were like the young people because I have like many younger friends and they said, ah, oh, we don't care about politics. Ah, uh, Merkel is nice. We have nice bars, Birmingham, blah, blah. So no, the things like you were like so effective up to that thing. So you were like responsible about your governments because your government is not taking care only about like Germany or like EU because they're like responsible about many countries speaking about US or whatever and like the second thing like you can spread word about that things many people they don't have like any idea about what's going on in Syria and for them it's like white and black like ISIS and Assad blah blah people are killing each other but it's not like that so just to have people being educated and aware about what happened and then we will be able to solve like many issues so I was like the first time when the movie was premiered was in US and Trump came with the first travel ban and I was there and like I had like many people coming to me oh we're sorry we're sorry what we should do but like then it was like the first time to find this solidarity with Muslims from Americans so it never happened until Trump got elected and then like I've seen them like I flew from Utah to DC and I've seen like a huge queue of people are demonstrating outside and then they turn to be activists so when you care about something or you're facing even like a small at anything you can feel about the others so that also like another important thing like spread words spread awareness there are like not only RBSS and Syria that they're doing a good work there are like thousands of groups there are like thousands of amazing Syrian groups so for us as young generation of Syrians we've We've been part of this revolution, and we we were able to create and develop this so-called like citizen journalism. So most of the activists or the journalists in Syria, none of like most of them didn't study any media or any journalism. But we were able like just to create this movement. So talking about RBSS, none of us study any journalism or me. Like we supposed like for me, I supposed to be like biologist dealing with carbon and oxygen and here I'm speaking about ISIS like my colleagues are supposed to be like scientists doctors and all that stuff so spreading words is so important and then you can like support many groups by donations by like spreading words by telling you like you fought the movie today and like for sure each of you have has at least one friend so you can tell that a friend family member or whatever and I do believe that you might have enemies even tell your enemies they might be interested so and and then we'll have like a whole world educated, not only about Syria, but other issues going on around the world. You've just mentioned the word uh, citizen journalists, and, and you're sort of the prototype of citizen journalists, so to speak. From and yeah, this, this has been a new phenomenon uh, that hasn't really been around prior to this uh, Syrian war. This hasn't, hasn't had much significance. W would you consider yourselves more activists or more journalists or something in between, or don't these distinctions matter anyway? So it's been like so confused up to the labels because I don't like to show like labels for myself. So like being invited to many conferences, like they introduced me like a ah, human rights defender, activist, citizen journalist, journalist, and thousands of things. So for me, like the labels are not something important more than the things that people are doing. And like speaking especially about Syria, when we are dealing with such dictators or government like Assad regime, where they prevented all most of the media organization to come and cover what's going on. And like ISIS did the same. So that helped to create this culture of citizen journalists. So people, they had to be journalists suddenly. Like for me, like I didn't know how I started and I didn't know where I will end up like, or where I will 
European like after one or two years. So for me, like if you will ask me like in 2011, I was that one who's stealing money from his dad, smoking cigarettes all the time, being in bars. So I didn't think that I will end up doing all that thing. So, but then like what happened in the county forced many people to go through that things. So for me, when I was like in demonstrations and where the demonstration were, all over the country and going back home, watching the local TV speaking, what will happen to the earth if the sun will disappear? Since like thousands of people were arrested, killed, shot, and then here where we found like thousands of Syrians going to the streets with their phones. And then like having this like bad quality videos being in Al Jazeera and like many Arabic channels. So here where we started to know that we were like effective, like with like, even with like, like bad quality phones, we can make a change. We've been speaking very specifically about Raqqa now, for, because I mean, that's the city you come from and where you're active. Is there anywhere in Syria where the, the media situation is, is, specifically the media freedom situation is significantly better? Or uh, who, who, how does, what does it look like nowadays and in other parts of Syria? So like, in general, you can I can't say that there is like the media like, or like the freedom of speech is like perfect in such area, but yeah, for sure it's different from city to another and like up to the groups. So always there are like limits for every each group. So talking about YBG, which is basically funded and supported by US, talking like, about the international community, they do have like human rights violations and they do have limit to the media. So many journalists, they went to Raqqa to cover like SDF or being with SDF. And I met one of the journalists who came back and he told me like the first thing they did, they took my passport. So, and I was surrounded with YBG fighters all the time. So he couldn't speak freely with the locals. So, okay, you can come, you can do interviews, but you, we will be around you. So if you were like a local and like seeing those fighters, you will not be able like just to express whatever you want. And then since they do have your, hold your passport, you will, you will be like all like have this concerns about your passport. And like, they can say anything that he was killed by a landmine or whatever. So even like speaking about like all the groups, I can say that there is like a perfect group, but it's like difference. There is like a level of difference between a group to another. The government did the same thing. They let like many journalists to come, but they were like forced to see things that the governments wanted them to see. So they don't have the free to move. And like, unfortunately, like for foreigner journalists turned to be like a huge bag of money for the groups, you know? So they might be kidnapped. Like we have like, an example here. So for them, like for all the groups, they don't care what they're doing more than they are. Ah, they have money. So ah, when like when Nicola was arrested, they are ah, he's a French, and then the French government will pay us. So that's the reason why like journalists such Nicola stopped going to Syria, which is was so important for us, like just to support our case, to support the revolution, to have like journalists like Nicola to be there, like to speak out because he will be able to make a change or be effective in his community with the French media, with the international media. But unfortunately, most of the groups, they looked at the foreign journalists as bag of money. And then that's why we were pushing local activists or citizen journalists to take care or like do that work. Because if they will be arrested or kidnapped, like the government will not pay for them. Do you still... Um See, see any chance of, of going back to Raqqa in the foreseeable future? I was like waiting for that moment when Raqqa will be liberated, but unfortunately it was not liberated, more it was controlled by a new group. Yeah, for sure I would love to go there, but like not in this such situations. But for sure I believe like me as many Syrians, we're waiting for like the moment when we'll be back home. For me, I don't want to stay here anymore or like, being outside, I would prefer like to be in like my old room smoking cigars and drink tea. So I don't know. So hopefully one day, and that's the reason why like RBSS and like many groups are fighting and doing that things. And would there be a point at which at which a group would just be able to dissolve because their mission is accomplished? It's so complicated, like speaking about Syria, like for me sometimes as a Syrian who's been following everything, I feel that I don't understand what's going on in some point. Like speaking about like thousands of groups, 10 of countries, like it turned to be like a World Cup, you know, like countries from everywhere, like, okay, we're from everywhere, like, okay, right now, like, 
I like I like even for us as a Syrians, we make like jokes about our crisis. So we say, ah, oh, right now, okay, if you want to visit US, you can go to Raqqa. If you want to visit Russia, you can go to Damascus or like Latakia. If you want to visit Iran, you can go to this place. If you want to visit Lebanon. So right now we have all the countries in Syria. So we don't want to like to go. And, so that the thing is turned to be a proxy war, having all those countries fighting each other, having like tens and hundreds of militias fighting in Syria. So 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 complicated and like just looking for a solution every single part has its own agenda and its own interest in syria unfortunately it's not a local issue anymore before we open up to to more questions from the audience maybe one one question from for my, my one last question from my side to, to nicola uh, what um what can we also as, as an international community do to, to prevent other places like well, of experiencing the same. We've talked about the yeah, radicalization in all kinds of places. What, what can be done to prevent this kind of thing? Well, it's way beyond the, the well, what a journalist can achieve. I mean, or even citizens. Uh, well, obviously, uh, uh, we have um, everywhere in the world um, countries that are autocratic. And in these countries, we have people willing to uh, gain liberty and to get their freedom. And well, we have to support these people, meaning that we also have to understand who uh, challenge these people. And sometimes these people uh, have supporters in our own countries. And it's not a surprise that uh, many Assad supporters are now trying to uh, target you and pretend that you are ISIS supporters, which is just insane after what we just have seen in, this, in the movie. But, uh, well, many people are actually trying to uh, tag you as ISIS supporter, which is just laugh laughable, and it's good to see you laughing about that. Sure, sure. <laughs> Yeah, sure. It's like sometimes it's funny. You need to make fun about your crisis. So unless I can't make fun about other people, I make fun about myself, my colleagues, my friends. Yeah. So sometimes, like, which, uh, like I call my friends, hey, I a supporter. Hey, as a supporter. So yeah, like having all people like labeling us different names or like pushing us to be like pro whatever groups, it turned like to be a comedy thing. So in some way. So humor is definitely a good strategy, I think. <laughs> So uh, let's, I, I'm sure there's still, uh, there are many more questions from the audience, so maybe we can take a couple more before we then uh, continue to discuss over a beer. Uh, but let's, let's see if there are any more questions. So my question is for Aziz. Um, do you, what, where, who do you think make uh, ES at that time in Raqqa very strong? Syrian people or more than the foreign, foreign jihadists who are coming from uh, uh, Germany or from Europe or whatever? How that been like? I, I, I remember 2013 ES was, was very small, so at one time very big. How they get like more support from Syrian people who was living in Raqqa or you think more from the people who coming outside from Europe or from Turkey and uh, they come to fight with them. This is the first question. And uh, my second question for Nico, how did you uh, went out uh, and um, how was the way coming, coming back here from Syria? Okay, like first question. So the thing is how they gain their support or like how they develop their own economy. Speaking about Raqqa itself, so Raqqa was ignored by the government, so it was like even forgetting like they didn't like they didn't show like Raqqa even in the weather news. So we were like almost disappear. And then like talking about Raqqa, it has oil, it's like rich with oil, with gas, with agriculture, with antique use, with historical places, with all the stuff which was not organized. Like and or like the government was trying to ignore for like several reasons because the first attempt to assassinate Hafdal Assad was in Raqqa when he's 
tried like to open like Tabqa Dam. So, and after that, the city was forgotten. And as Bashar al-Assad, when he was elected, he didn't visit Raqqa until 2011. He was elected in 2000. So after 11 years, he, he's never been to Raqqa. So, and he came because it was like, kind of like the more like, like was like a safer place for him to be in. And it was like for a couple of hours and then he just disappeared. So whenever you have money, whenever you have economy, ISIS later on were able to develop like this propaganda, this media machine that turned to be way more professional than Hollywood. And then they were able to recruit many people. So talking about the percentage of Raqqa people who joined ISIS, it's, it's less than one person. So ISIS was able to recruit people from more than 84 countries. So, and that's the thing. So, and when they got all this count, all these fighters or jihadists, they gained more attention because speaking about Assad regime, Assad regime like killed like more of the Syrians. 98 percent of the Syrians have been killed by Assad, and like the international community did nothing. But when ISIS in a couple of months they started their campaign, and if we will ask ourselves why, because those jihadists are from. France, from Germany, from all over the world, they turned and they started to join ISIS. So they were like more, more or less the main creator or supporter for ISIS. And more, more or less most of them, they didn't join because only they did believe in ISIS. Many of them like went and joined just to gain power. Speaking about Dizzy Dog like, or like whatever, Abu Talha Al-Almani, he was like a rubber here wearing like t-shirt anti-Islam, like he was like kind of a habister, blah, blah, being arrested many times. And then he turned to be like a famous jihadist in Syria with ISIS. And what he was doing, just taking selfie, and you'll find all the German news, news speaking like in the first page, ah, Abu Talha Al-Almani, DZ talk, talk a selfie. And it was like in the first pages. So he turned from being nothing in his community, he was completely ignored by his community, and he turned to be like that famous person. So, and many other went there for money, for sex, girls, blah, blah. So it's also like the fault of the governments here. So many of them, they like, they forced people to live in such bad situation and they didn't find any meaning of their lives, only to go and join ISIS. So I could say more or less the foreigners who weren't there, and for sure there are like some locals, but the main focus of ISIS was just to get more foreigners than the locals because for them, okay, we have like Americans and they started to to, like, to produce these videos like in French, in Russian, in Shishani, in Arabic, in all the languages to get more and more and to get even the international community attention. I just would like to elaborate a bit on uh, what Aziz just said uh, about Raqqa and Mosul. Well, Aziz had two capital cities. Uh, he lost both of them now, but he ha it was walking on these two feet. Mosul, much bigger than Raqqa in Iraq, uh, was the economic and the political uh, capital city. Raqqa, somehow smaller, but still very important on the Syrian scale, was the capital city for the foreign fighters. So all the jihadis would leave, well, virtually all of the jihadis would leave um, Europe, for instance, would go to Raqqa at some point. Uh, so for the for the propaganda machine, it was just a tremendous uh, role that this city played. And to answer now your question, uh, well, um, I have been uh, released by my jailers after I assumed negotiations. I don't know the details, but uh, that was a, a huge, uh, um, well, uh, uh, attack. Uh, I was part of a, a huge campaign uh, against foreigners. We were a total of 23 uh, Western hostages kept together, and uh, about 15 have been released, um, and uh, seven have been killed, and one uh, is now entering today is six years in captivity. This is John Cantley, the uh, British reporter who has been uh, captured five years and one day ago. And I think we can, uh, well, well, keep it, keep him in, in our minds tonight.
question. Thank you very much for your great work, and I hope it will continue. As you said, you know, one atrocity is being followed by another one. So I think your reporting is, is uh, pivotal to, to uh, get news out of Syria. Uh, my question is uh, concerning the future of Syria, and especially on the local level. You talked about the proxy wars, but you know, seeing all these atrocities, there will be a lot of revenge and hatred. So is there any chance of reconciliation on the local level? Yeah, for sure, but like it's more or less how to have access to the community there. So speaking about Iraq, like, okay, Iraq is still living in a bad condition. So Iraq didn't get like to a democratic country or to a safe country. And like a couple of days, I just had a look on a map showing like the attacks in Iraq with red points and like Iraq was completely red which means that every part or neighborhood in Iraq had been attacked. So this is the problem that the international community don't push to do more work or like to encourage civil society organizations to take part of it. Because like the hateness started to spread among the region. So it started in Iraq, Syria, like, like right now it might turn, Lebanon is almost close. So all this region, so the thing like to have locals deal with the locals and even with the international community attempt to do anything, they do it completely in the bad way. I once I went to speak with Muslim community and they told me they told me, oh, they send us someone from the State Department to speak with us. So for them having someone from the State Department, whatever he will say, the people they will do the opposite. Because, okay, they have this idea that the U.S. government is such a bad government. So if they will tell them, okay, don't be ISIS, they will be ISIS. So that's the thing. The government should be, like, a bit smarter. Like, I don't know, like, how many, how stupid many governments are. Like, it doesn't need that things. They're, like, spreading or, like, wasting money doing, like, stupid things. Like, first, like, once they were, like, just <laughs> spreading posters by warplanes over Syria and, like, ISIS territories. And they were like doing like, like making Al Baghdadi like Mickey Mouse. So I told them like that costs you like billions of dollars and it's stupid. Like at least it made people laughing at you. And you thought that you were like so effective. So like this the thing that the government should think. So first thing, and that's the thing that we're missing. So when we're like when I meet like with anyone UN or whatever, they miss thinking and they think that they're doing a great job and they're like amazing. Uh, we spread like a photo of Abu Bakr Baghdadi being a Mickey Mouse. That's stupid. So, but they, for them, oh, it's amazing. So that's the thing. So we need just to encourage local people to know. Like when I speak with a Syrian, I know what we're speaking about. Not like having someone like, sorry, from Germany or US, oh, ha, ha. they don't know how to speak with us. So for me, when I speak with Syrians, I know what we're speaking about. We need, like, sorry, we know our shits, you know? But those people, they come from fancy houses, like from fancy environments, and trying to attempt to be cool and expert, reading three or four books about Syria, and they've never been, they don't speak the language. They, they have nothing to do, they just read four or five books and they come with solutions and strategies. So that's the point that they need to think. <laughs> okay, maybe one last question and then I suggest we come yeah. to an end. One last question. To the right. Well, um, I have two questions actually. Um, one is about the film itself. So I want to know. Uh, oh, stand up. So I want to know um, how the whole project developed. So how were you approached by Matthew Einman, and uh, if the movie was thought in the first place the way then it was realized, and. Um, or uh, if you change your mind, and uh, I don't know if you even told like you, your your collaborators, um, for example, inside Raqqa, if about the movie and I don't know all, so the whole process. And the other question um, before Nicholas said uh, about um, so the brutalities that we can see in the movie, 
in the film, sorry. And, um, and you said there is too many, actually. And uh, I mean, there were actually many and really, really terrifying scenes. But um, I wonder, I mean, for example, in the news, in the newscast, I never seen anything of this sort. <clears throat> so I wonder, shouldn't we uh, be more used to see scenes like this to raise awareness and yeah, so like the first question. I do. Is this working? Yeah. So the first question, like first, like how we decided to make that movie. So we we're not planning to do any movie or anything up to security reasons, and it happened that we were in my like couple of my colleagues and I it happened to be in D.C. to receive International Press Freedom Award, like the like the ceremony that you've seen like at the beginning of the movie, and we were in D.C. Basically, doing like mini meetings, conference, interviews, and uh, Matt, the movie director, reached us out through an organization that we know in common, CBJ, that's committed to protect journalists, the organization that gave us the award. And I got the email personally from one of the organizers saying that there is a movie director who wanted to meet us. And I emailed him back saying, like, we're so tired and we would prefer to sleep. And he was so nice organizer who took us out, and we said he said like ah oh, it's in our in our office at three minutes walking, you need to come. And then I thought like my colleagues, okay, he's been so nice with us, let's go. And yeah, we went and we decided to say no in like in a nice way. And we went and we thought that we're gonna meet like 80, 90 years old movie maker, and we ended up meeting like 30s guy. And we said oh, it's not sound as a professional movie maker. And then he started to speak and we watched the trailer of his last documentary which is called Cartel and it's on Netflix if you want to watch it's a great movie. Yeah. So and then we watched the trailer and we said, oh wow, he's a professional. And then he said like that we don't need to answer or like to give him an answer and we thought about it and we knew doing this documentary will help us to get our message out and to educate other people about what was going on in Syria, in general, and in Iraq specifically. So, and for us, like doing what we were doing with RBSS, it was just to get the message out. And like we knew this documentary will be also helpful for us. So we decided to make it, even that movie increased the level of the threat, and we knew about it. So, but we decided just to risk it to get our message out more and more. And yeah, for us it was like so worried just to work or like being with during this process. But we used to be with this amazing team and like Matt spent like a lot of time with us and that helped us to build that trustful relation to be open for him. It didn't start like it didn't happen in the first week or the second week or the first month. It's been like months of filming and being with us. And yeah, like we have like an amazing team who worked in the movie. And we have here Max who was filming us. He's here between you guys. And I want to thank him. So like, yeah, like we've been dealing with like a great team and that helped us more like to be more open so and we turned to be friends in some point more than like people who are filming us even after we finished the movie we've been meeting like drinking whatever and the second question about like this scenes in the movie so those things are happening every single day in Syria and it's a fact that people are trying to close their eyes about so for us like we were a brush and pushing them to show the scenes and for me in many presentations and many conference I used this such of videos because people they need to know because you don't watch that things in the media you don't watch it in the news but that things is happening in somewhere in this part of world and you might you need to acknowledge it so and like I know like they try to make it less and less not to let people run out of the cinema theaters in some point but at the same time we wanted like the people to be aware about what's going on because like okay none of us as Syrian thought that things will transfer from Afghanistan to be in Syria and Iraq and but like it might come here to Germany like I know here like you face like a hard time after the Second World War and you many of you like heard the stories about what happened. So it's always good to remind people about that there are like people in this part of war 
in world that are, that they are facing this kind of atrocities. And people, they need to acknowledge it because if we will not be banned or we will not feel the other bans. So it was so important for us just to highlight that thing. Actually, when you cover uh, terrorism, as a journalist, you have two mantras. The first one is denial, because the first time you, are f you face terrorism, you don't believe what you see. The second threat is uh, panic and just a uh, state of sideration. And this is caused by uh, the fact that uh, the, psychologic the psychological part of terrorism is much bigger than the cinetic one. So basically, the idea of terrorism is to kill one person, but to threaten 10,000 of them. So it's one people dying and everybody looking around and afraid. And this is actually the, the point uh, with terrorism. And this is uh, what we shall avoid as journalists while covering terrorism. So basically, the idea of covering terrorism, and there has been a couple of uh, guideline books issued uh, with recommendation for journalists uh, covering terrorism. The idea is to be extremely uh, descriptive. So basically, and but clinical, cl clinically descriptive. And not to, well, to prevent ourselves to issue judgment and to just say what happened in a very neutral way, uh, avoiding to spread all the ideas that the, uh, the attacker want us to spread, and especially to uh, uh, trying not to spread the fear. And another point, of course, is a total respect of the victims. Because uh, when you have violence, you have victims. And uh, the coverage of this violence must be totally respectful of the people wounded or killed. OK, I think we should leave it at that, although it was not <laughs> any. Any, well, any nice closing word, but it's still important to, to bear in mind. And I think there are some journalists in the audience as well, so it's always good to remember those things. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I think we'll have an opportunity to continue talking outside. Um, well, continue, please continue spreading the word about this important work uh, these citizen journalists are doing, and um, have a good night. Good night.